There's our opening. I always hit the wrong little spot. That stupid media player has got a weird little menu. Welcome to Evolution Hour. We are now back at home. TortukenWordPress.com is our website. And um, as I will remind everyone, I put links to all of these things in the uh, video uh, description. Uh, all the files there are open access. Everybody can download them and play uh, with them as you will. There's an awful lot of neat little stuff in there. It's kind of like the, the foundational structure for what I've been doing in the books and uh, such like since then. Uh, most of that material dates to up to about 2004 or so. So now it's getting to be yikes, close to 20 years old. Eek. Uh, how much fun I've been having over these many, many decades. Anyway, let us also put up our friendly neighborhood Patreon. That one I do have to remember to put up full screen, otherwise it doesn't share it properly. Our uh, our tape, our colleagues, our researchers, our assistant researchers, our friends, and our legacy patrons. Um, you're a steadfast bunch that's holding on at every little bit, and I'm holding on at every little bit, thanking you very much for all the help that you've been able to do uh, to keep me uh, um, moving uh, slightly above the social security level, which is where... I'm at uh, in the actual world, and uh, the idiots in Congress managed to uh, not screw up uh, the uh, government shutdown and got that out of the way, and the government continuing, at least for another a few weeks until more chaos hits. Isn't, isn't our century exciting? Uh, anyway, um, here we are in uh, the continuing saga of this charming little book that I picked up last February in um, Idaho, uh, attending a creationist conference, uh, well, meeting uh, for basically Idaho homeschoolers uh, that um, uh, CMI, Creation Ministries International, uh, put on. And with a very, very, very lower echelon creationist apologist who doesn't seem to even know a hell of a lot, uh, Tom Gillis, who didn't seem to know a great deal about their own technical lore. So... They really didn't need to do better than that. But we've moved out of chapter three and into chapter four, which is all about kinds, or at least the cartoon version of kinds that is depicted in the creationist literature. There's not a great deal going on about uh, technical literature in this particular chapter. The vast majority of it turns out to be postings of creationist stuff. A little later on, they're apparently going to be riffing off of a Stephen Jay Gould uh, book that I have in my library, so I'm going to be cross-checking uh, uh, that little puppy. Unfortunately, I don't have a linkage, so I won't be able to put that up on it, but we'll see what's going on there. Um, and um, the uh, whole bit, the upshot of this chapter is that, oh my, oh my, the Bible allows for really rapid speciation. Uh, that in fact the Bible account um, implies super fast speciation, which is not really true. Um, the Bible doesn't really commit itself on any of this stuff. The only reason why creationists have had to move to a hyper fast speciation is because they have too many species to account for in the fossil record and in the living world to cram onto the ark. Because remember that double bottleneck of creation week and then the filtered version of the flood uh, mandates uh, limits as to how many critters there can be and that the creation event has to be 6,000 years ago, no new kinds after that. So any differentiation within a kind cannot exceed the boundary of a kind. So no new things can come along. So no matter how varied an organism may look, um, its progenitor has to have been on aboard the ark. Uh, well, there's a little bit of disingenuousness uh, on the, um, the Sarfati and Tayamout count, which is clear enough when you start looking outside of it. So I'm going to be putting some posts up to one from 2006 um, at uh, the National Center for Science Education, which incidentally is doing a criticism of an intelligent design book, uh, but basically going into the history of uh, creationist attitudes about what kinds were and to what extent did they allow for speciation and the fixity of kinds? And uh, it is a fair thing to say that not all creationists were committed 
to the idea of uh, of fixed kinds, although it was an extremely popular version that was uh, going on uh, certainly into Darwin's time, uh, but that faced with the need, Linnaeus had to deal with it and others long before Darwin came along, as the mounting number of species accumulated, uh, the notion of the fixity of species got to be vaguer and vaguer and vaguer. Now, the fact that this memo has not filtered easily downstream in creationist circles is constantly reiterated by the number of creationists I bump into online and elsewhere who think that created kinds are species and that speciation can't take place at all, which, as we know from reading creationist literature today, oh no, they accept lots and lots of speciation, unless you move over into the intelligent design camp, in which case they don't think about it at all. Um, the other little paper that I'll be putting up um, is the creationist version of the history of this, which is Todd Wood. And this is one from 2008, just a couple of years after Wilkins. And Wood is a careful and meticulous creationist scholar who is fair enough with the facts that he doesn't try to contort. He may miss some of the data when he wants to maintain his uh, technical arguments, but um, he's a, a fair enough and honest creation in this respect. So put those two accounts together and you'll be able to get a better sense about what the variety was and how semi-fixed species were thought of within certain contexts. Certainly the, um, uh, the literalist approach in the 1900 era was that species are fixed, and we know that that's still the case today with uh, most grassroots creationists who conflate species with kinds. Uh, in the higher echelon bunch, the uh, Marsh with his Barrowmans coming in in the 1940s, and then that's picked up by Wood and others in the um, uh, really turn of the century, uh, 1999 on period. Um, they are uh, recognizing that um, pretty much in their model, the family, which is the traditional conception of a kind uh, in um, popular lore, and that connection between the family and a genus and a species as you move downstream, uh, that blur was much easier to do in the old days when you had relatively few species that you thought about within a kind. So you weren't necessarily having to think about the entire range of bulls because you were aware of all the different bovids that exist around the planet. Uh, likewise for canids and all of these others. So they could easily think of basically barnyard animals, many of whom have become domesticated uh, by the time Bible writers were uh, putting things down. So their disconnect from that larger natural world that is reflected in uh, paleontology uh, that was only starting to kick into high gear in the 19th century um, easily allowed them never to think about this much. So... Um, only one technical paper comes up in this particular segment uh, of uh, Sarfati and Tay, and it's uh, Fraser 1995 on the minimal gene level of the sexually transmitted pathogen mycoplasma. And I'll be putting the link up to that little puppy. Uh, all of Sarfati and Tay just name drop this uh, as an example of kind of the smallest genome. Nothing at all about what mycoplasma was doing, um, that it was a pathogen, or uh, what did it originally develop from in a kind. Uh, now, I have no, no comments on that whatsoever. Um, and so its little 585 kilobases of DNA, um, where did it come from? What organism was it? Um, it looks like, for one thing, because there are so few in the group, and this one is so highly modified, and it was only discovered in the 20th century, uh, this particular version of it, that there is a certain amount of suspicion that it's a relatively recent development. Um, no opinions come from Sarfati and Tay on the subject, but I've, I'm going to be putting up a link to a paper from um, McGowan in 2017, which uh, goes into all of its pathogenicity and how it was detected and all of that and what it may be related to, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, the backstory and other papers that I was look, were looking on uh, with the same kind of topic um, are all kind of going, well, we can't really say how recently this thing developed. We only know that it was in existence by the 19... Uh, 80s and 90s when it was being initially characterized, but maybe it hasn't actually been around all that long. Uh, now, betwixt there, even in 6,000 years and the created kind, um, is a gap 
that Sarfati and Tay could have shown how fabulously useful their uh, baromenology thinking is, but since it isn't fabulously useful, they're not actually going to be able to pull that little trick off. Now, part two of the uh, show um, is um, um, a piece from David Thomas uh, from uh, last year on Bacteria Master Compass Builders. Um, it was in Creation Magazine. CMI just seems addicted to reposting an awful lot of old stuff, but also sticking up some new stuff. And at least for the moment, I'm on their mailing list. Um, other ones kind of drop that matter. Uh, the Discovery Institute, I think, has trimmed things away so people can't comment on any of their posts and they don't have um, uh, emails and announcements going out in the way they used to 10 years ago or more, um, uh, telling about their great important things. To many, to much expect, um, the design movement has gotten to be so boring uh, and peripheral that if you want to really see the fun, uh, stupid statements, uh, they're coming from the old school creationist stuff like CMI, AIG, and ICR. Anyhow, um, as you might expect, it's all gee whiz. Uh, wow, magnetic sensing bacteria. Wow, that's amazing. Wow, that must be designed. whoop de doo and so um, uh, he's fielding some very basic work on the subject, uh, Mosaskew 2014, that I'll be putting a link up to, and Muller from 2020. Um, and even at that, you can compare the detail of the material in even those pieces with the kind of fluffy nothing that Dave Thomas is putting into his post. Um, and of course, uh, I think one of the reasons why Thomas may have picked on those is because neither one of them are going into any depth as to what kind of evolutionary history uh, the magnetosomes might have had in bacteria. So I think apologetically, uh, a lot of creationists are very cagey about what they cite in the regular literature because they don't want readers accidentally to be exposed to too much of that evolution material. So it's much you, more useful to their apologetics if they can pick on stuff that will have the gee whiz quality about it and won't really be speculating about evolutionary things where they'll be discussing phylogenies and various other issues. That doesn't mean there aren't such things. They're just not going to be showing up in Dave Thomas. So um, let's move a little bit beyond that. Um, because there was, by the time Dave Thomas was doing that, quite a big set of literature on the magnetosomes and potential characteristics that related to bigger picture. So there's a paper from 2017 from Lynn that I'll be putting up, and uh, in fact, three of them, um, and uh, a 2018 one, four, and um, then from 2020, a Montiel from Nature, and then Goswami 22, 2022, in other words, roughly about the same time that uh, Thomas is doing his little shtick uh, on the advantages of magnetic navigation in an oxygenating environment and how much lateral gene transfer may have been involved in the lineages that produce magnetosomes. Um, as for the genes involved, Thomas actually cited some work on that, although he just picked up just a nick. Uh, for a design congenial phrase like unexpectedly high accuracy and sophisticated mechanical scaffold from uh, Toro um, Nehupan 2016, which I'll be putting the link up, which related to the MAMK protein filaments uh, and uh, a, a 2019 one on the uh, newly found component MAMY. So they're, they're, what this means is that we're clearly in the process of trying to figure out what the hell's going on with the magnetosomes. What are they? What's the genes that are involved in them? What lineages are they, are they to be found in? Uh, and that's always a dead giveaway that the creationist is playing siphon off the current, but yet very rudimentary research, and then probably drop the subject as the work proceeds to the point where review papers start showing up in the annual reviews of this and that, where they make sense of all of this material and fit it in and people start doing more detailed phylogenies. They do more and more about the origin of the various biochemical systems. So uh, you can put a little pin 
for those of you who are into mycoplasma uh, and magnetosomes and all of that to see how much creationist coverage and Joel Duff, if you're watching at some point, that's another one that you can be pinning up in the thing is to keep an eye out because frankly, Joel keeps track of the ICR, AIG, CMI group, frankly, at more detail than I, I tend to do because there's just too much stuff flitting around in there. Oh, hello, purple. Greetings, sentient beings. Um, that <clears throat> uh, people can keep track of the degree to which the creationist ends up um, picking up on any of the subsequent work. My take, and Joel and various other people who follow these areas can let me know about their perspective on it, um, is that no, they tend not to do that. So they'll waive a piece that was done a long time ago. That happens quite a bit, but yet not think to do research on anything more updating. Uh, if the updating material can be seen to reinforce the creationist perspective, then they'll call attention to it, fine and dandy. The area that they can't do this so easily with, uh, and they're kind of forced into dealing with, and that's not this topic of this particular episode, is if the thing that's being discussed is so popular, it's in the regular press, there's news announcements on the evening news about such and so, and these tend to be like paleontological finds, um, uh, typically. And if that stuff gets waved in the public media enough, then the odds are that the creationists will decide they've got to deal with it and bring in their people to dispose of it and eliminate the evolutionary content of it. Uh, that's true for the various feathered dinosaur finds. It's true for Tiktaalik and transitional forms. There's just a brand new paper that just popped out on uh, the early origin of uh, nastostomes, of, of filling in a gap in the development of the vertebrate head uh, that we'll find out whether any creationist uh, dives into it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, um, um, that's another relevant issue in there. Uh, that they um, that they use the updated material for their apologetics purposes. Um, it's a, a risky operation and by and large takes a particularly persnickety annoying mind to be able to do that kind of thing on a regular basis. Uh, David Capez is one of those that does that. He trawls through uh, every once in a while, I, I get the bee in my bonnet and I'll dive into his website, which, by the way, Jonathan Sarfati has started doing cross posts. I think it's Jonathan Sarfati, maybe Jerry Bergman and that, too, have done some stuff over at the uh, little website, Creation um, something or other, that um, uh, he's been running for quite some time. And, um, do, do, oops, where are we? Uh, Keep on thinking. Greeting, folks. The government may not be shut down, but so is dysfunctional as might as well be. Indeed, yes. Everything is proceeding just day by day on this. Uh, um, I what I've wanted to see. I'll, I'll suddenly take, take a divergent because I've basically gone through all the main material that I wanted. Oh no, I haven't quite finished. Um, let's see. Da, 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 the magnetosome, um, the Liu research, all those papers that. Um, uh, uh, oops, I should have book. I get the right mouse there. Uh, the Lind research uh, that's in there was working on the idea that um, da, 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 da. I got two keyboards floating around in here, and I keep on reaching over to the wrong one uh, in uh, in doing stuff. Um, the Lind research suggesting that the biology in those magnetosomes originated a very long time ago, and um, they're ferreting out what the homologies might be and with extant proteins and so forth. But Bergeron 2017 uh, is characterizing that MAMK uh, system as uh, something that appears to be a variant of actin proteins. So with that Bergeron paper, which the creationist is not citing, um, even though it's embedded in the material that's being discussed uh, by that Lynn paper, there's the danger of citing technical literature that's got a lot of content. Um, is that uh, bit by bit, the researchers are going to be piecing together these larger pieces. And eventually, five, 10 years down the road, uh, you're going to be seeing much more elaborate reports that will most likely not be popping up in the creationist literature. Uh, oh, did Trump fan uh, MTG say it shut down his payback for COVID lockdown that happened under? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the fascinating thing about Marjorie Taylor Greene is she is a complete nutball that 
I can't think of anybody in politics within my lifetime who is just practically a litmus test for being wrong on everything. That whatever views come out of her mouth are disconnected to reality and presumably connect with some apologetic back source. The, the serious problem that I keep um, commenting on, and I want people to deal with it in the media, which is you should be asking source methods questions of these people. Um, it just drives me nuts, and it's a short trip sometimes, but it drives me nuts when I'm watching uh, um, This Week with George Stephanopoulos or Meet the Press or any of these other various regular traditional news programs, and they've got perfectly fine reporters and commentators, and they're discussing the political implications of things and blah, 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 fine and dandy. And they have guests on, and they ask them uh, some probing questions about what their policies are and what their view is on this particular matter. And if they're evading on the subject, they're trying to pin them down, and the person is bounding away with uh, evasive responses and so forth and so on, all of which is okay to explore. But if they're making a statement on a matter of policy, which is grounded in a supposed fact of what government revenues are or expenditures or environmental policies or fill in the blank. Um, what sources are they relying on? Out of thin air? I don't think Marjorie Taylor Greene is getting her stuff by Ouija board, although sometimes the Jewish space lasers may be. Um, but most of the time, I'm sure it's sucking up from apologetic literature and, and apologetic posts, probably, and some of which will be internet, some of which will be stuff they watch on video, from Fox Trump Pravda and Newsmax and OAN and Epoch Times and uh, Real America Now, that's uh, Steve Bannon's uh, propaganda network and all that kind of stuff. Um, one which relates to uh, the indicted one, Mr. Trump, uh, just Recently, he was blathering on about how windmills are supposedly killing the whales. Well, that was a cutie. And several other people on my Twitter feed have been uh, calling attention to that as well. And so I had to start looking into it. Um, and it's a relevant point because Jackson Wheat and I plan on doing another book in, uh, down the road about conspiracy thinking and climate research. And all that is going to be part of the grist of how uh, climate denialists and that operate. And there's a bunch of stuff. Anyway, um, the Fox News in particular has been the primary promulgator of this particular trope that they have relied upon this nutball libertarian guy who has done a, a documentary proclaiming that whales are being endangered. He's actually financed in part by the oil industry and all that. Uh, yeah, they, uh, uh, it, it's been circulating around in the blogosphere route. Uh, I encountered it over the weekend, and so I was uh, uh, over the last few days and uh, uh, have been putting linking. Uh, Media Matters has gone into some of this, and the uh, BBC has uh, gone into some of it as well. Um, the, but the fact is that, that uh, no, uh, windmills aren't killing whales. The people that claim they are are cherry picking information and data field that comes from actual government agencies, but it doesn't have anything to do with what they're talking about. Uh, um, that supposedly some of the sonar things that the boats that are used to construct the things you use have been endangering the whales. And the problem is, is that the material about potential sonic uh, impact on whales comes from military applications, not and stuff relating to the oil industry. <laughs> Um, which is exactly not the connection that these uh, advocates are trying to do. And so it has all the same earmarks of this um, uh, cherry picking. Well, uh, presumably Donald Trump has been watching, as he probably tends to do, uh, the right wing medias. And so he bumps into these interview things on uh, Fox Trump Pravda and then promptly repeats that in the next speech he goes to. Now, a source methods analysis would be trying to pin down more of this daisy chain and to ask the person, A, where are they getting their information from? B, are they fact checking it? In which case we would learn just how superficial Trump or half of the people in Congress uh, are on these matters and that they never fact check things and very probably do not know how to fact check things or not realize they would need to do that. So, 
all of those little source methods things are not some effete hypothetical. Um, yeah, no one knows more about whale penises. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, we have to deal with that kind of a little subject. Uh, but the, uh, uh, by the way, we're going to be having quite a section on whale evolution and how creationists misrepresent whale evolution, which of course will bring in some intelligent design arguments as well as the material from uh, the Young Earth Creationist Movement in Volume 2 of the Rocks were there. We have lots of stuff going. I've already warned Jackson that uh, my my chapter on the big slosh tales of, of the flood and all the material on the legends and all the claptrap about living dinosaurs and the Noah's Ark searching and the soft tissue material and all of that, it got to the point where the chapter is so big <laughs> that I had to split it up to two chapters. You know, we can run in rough text shape in a word processor doc file uh, in the 80 to 100 pages or so uh, range. It, it's actually shorter when it's put into printed context because as anyone who knows from the rocks were there, the, we, we scrunch the print typeface down uh, fairly tight to make everything fit into the uh, realm. But at any rate, I realized, no, this was way too long for a single chapter. So I had to go through, split the thing up. And then there are references in some of the other sections of the book to, as mentioned in chapter, whoop, what I had to say is a chapter two or chapter three, because um, there's one more chapter in the book. Uh, that's how things, uh, that's exactly the growth pattern that occurred uh, when we started out on the project, because there's just so much crap that emanates from the creationist movement that to do justice to it and to also keep up to date to make sure that we've got all of the stuff uh, that's uh, cutting edge, um, uh, including new examples of creationist malfeasance and error and some of the Looney Tunes stuff that uh, pops up down the line. That it, It's a, a fun little juggling act. <coughs> well, uh, I will be charitable, Purple, is that the vast majority of creationists and rhino Trumpistas, I think, are in exactly the same boat, is that they are relying on... Um, yeah, with chapter 2B, yes. yeah, 2B or not 2B, that gets a little too Hamlet-y, I think. Um, but at any rate, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's nothing in principle to say I can't have a chapter that's 200 pages long, but yeah, it gets it gets a little mucky uh, to have it balanced out that way. But anyway, uh, on the source material, um, I think the vast majority of people who believe things that aren't true are seriously and honestly presenting information that they have culled from sources. So in their heads, they think they've got ammunition. Uh, there was just an idiot uh, just to, uh, a couple days ago who uh, put up a posting on the crime, Biden crime family. And it was a meme pick with a beautiful graphics. I mean, it's the sort of stuff that Carl Baugh and these other people would be doing uh, with just piles of little mentions about the source and how much money the Bidens are supposedly receiving. But no actual sources anywhere. It's just the claim that someone claimed this claim, but no documentation for any of it. And that person's mind confuses that secondary source for a primary source, as if that mere statement is a real thing. And the idea that the mere statement is not a real thing, it's only a statement of the thing that they're stating about. It's not a fact in and of itself, and without external documentation, can't be deemed to be a fact. And Indeed, when you start looking into these kinds of things, you discover that no, they're not facts, uh, that people are having innuendos and misrepresentations and Ritz Keller. Uh, the same thing was happening with Comer's commission on um, uh, the Hunter Biden matter, uh, that um, so much of it, even their own Republicans on the more moderate branch are going, oh, yeah, man, this is not going anywhere. You know, they don't have smoking guns on these things. And yet, Comer and uh, Jordan and the like uh, are still insistent that they are. Well, how do they do that? Look at how creationist minds work. Look at how flat earthers work. Look at how Holocaust deniers look, work. Look at how people who deny uh, that we landed on the moon. Uh, look at how people who are convinced that everybody but Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare's plays or that um, everybody but Lee Harvey Oswald was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Um, you get to these points where ultimately they're tracking from a relatively limited source field and that they have not bothered to look up 
whether or not that source field is accurate or not. They don't read outside of that little box. Marxist Leninists do exactly the same thing. Uh, there was a, a one that I ran into uh, when the source is the onion and they don't realize, oh, yes, that pops up. Yes. And the same thing with the Babylon Bee. Uh, Frank Turek seems not to realize that these are religious apologists and bumps into anti-evolutionism occasionally because he channels intelligent design. Um, but um, he's occasionally thrown out Babylon Bee posts um, that uh, do you not know this is a satirical humor site it's not a, a news media <laughs> it's not they're just making up shit you know and so when you get minds that are like that if they see information they want to be true that's a secondary source which may or may not have any connection to actual primary source information but it never occurs to them no little flag goes off into their heads that all they are looking at is a secondary source and Minds that can go down rabbit holes at the drop of a hat are people who literally cannot tell the difference between that. Now, I fortunately had a wonderful uh, historiography teacher in college, uh, been dead for years, I think now, um, Professor Brown, who um, uh, inculcated in me in my college days back in the 1970s, um, never confuse a primary and a secondary source. The moment you do that, you have made a catastrophic mistake. And therefore, you're, you are never going to be a good historian if you can't tell the difference between a primary and a secondary source. Uh, the secondary source may contain grains of truth or not, but you can't simply go, oh, well, that's what it says, and there it is. Well, look at what the religious mind does, where they're taking a human document that for their particular faith, and I don't need to use just the Bible on this. You can fill in the blank with any religious text. And it is presumed to be so, but all it is is a secondary document. Sometimes some of them have elements of primary source things to them. Uh, to some extent, uh, the, the Quran, frankly, is the musings of Muhammad, presumably. I, I don't think there's any serious argument that the vast majority of it isn't basically his little lecture notes as he would spew out information. And that's why as, if it's read chronologically, you can see the kind of changing positions that the guy makes over time as he comes back to the same issues and has a slightly different opinion than he did previously. Um, the um, New Testament would be having a little teeny core set of documents which are purporting to be by people who are from the Jesus period directly. However, they're all written far enough down the road and have enough little problems about them that yeah, it's a little more problematic. And one of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the, the, the main core gospels. Luke is by definition a secondary source. Luke did not personally know Jesus in the accounts. Uh, and he writes an accounting of this uh, of compiling material from who knows where. There's no reference bibliography. We don't have the primary sources to check to see whether or not Luke's accounts are accurate or not. You know, from a scholarly point of view, you're going, oh my gosh, we got problems with this, uh, which put it, frankly, in the same boat that you do when you get Atlantis um, in Plato's account. Plato is literally the only source for the Atlantis story. And everybody else that alludes to it after that is riffing off of that Platonic account and putting in their own particular things by the time you get down to somebody like Bellamy um, in the um, 19th century. And not Bellamy, oh, um, uh, Ragnarok guy. Um, I'd have to think. He served in Congress. He would be, he would be kind of a wacky um, Elon Muskish, I suppose. Somebody, you know, who has some accomplishments in one area, but all sorts of odd views in, in other kinds. Or, or Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I think he might fall into that kind of a, a background. Uh, anyway, um, filling in a whole new layer of their own particular stuff, that that thing gets picked up by a new generation of people. And so these that's how material churn. Well, there's no reason to think that religious documents weren't running exactly the same way. Um Yes, the sources. Uh, so that's why this source methods thing of requiring or probing anybody on where they're getting their material from is the golden path to at least annoying them. But at the very least, finding out 
where they stand on that methods um, form. Because if somebody is familiar enough with the material to be able to tell you about particular people and particular studies and the like, uh, that is at a much higher level than somebody, if you start probing them about a topic, they can't tell you anything about anything. Gillis, that's why Gillis in that Idaho creationist meeting uh, was such a disappointment because, gosh, other than simply repeating the patter of what he's got on the PowerPoint, uh, he doesn't really know much. And he has no curiosity to learn anything better. Um, yeah, the uh, um, from a historian's point of view, uh, we have a pile up of secondary sources. And of course, some of the material is directly contradictory to one another, which of course that brings an entirely different dynamic going on because one of the features about that Tortukan style mind is they have a problem seeing internal contradictions that you can literally have this and that not matching up. Uh, we had somebody like that in my family. My grandmother uh, had a, a just a blockhead mind that she would get something uh, into her head and um, the facts of the matter didn't matter. And it just, whoop, uh, that sort of person could easily vote for a Donald Trump uh, or for anybody. It could fly all over the place. Uh, but you find the same sort of operation going on in any dogmatic system. If you've got something like in North Korea, where you can also be killed uh, for having incorrect views in air quotes, uh, that adds up to a different and more intense dynamic, but it's the same kind of situation as people mouthing off during the Renaissance where they run the risk of running foul of the Inquisition. Uh, so any kinds of circumstances, other cultures have had exactly the same problem. The Chinese uh, have frequently had uh, intense areas from uh, the old imperial system that would be burning books and destroying uh, viewpoints that disagreed with uh, the official doctrine, uh, down to Mao Zedong's uh, cultural revolution in the 1960s. So this is a recurring problem in the human species, which means that the solutions and counter blocks to it have to be recurring too. that there are ways that you can slow that sort of thing down and everybody has to play into it because in part, uh, the acquiescence of a too big of a population to falsehood is when things start running off the rails and you get to the point where now the number of people who can speak truth to power diminishes below a threshold level and whoop, pretty soon civilizations have fallen apart. And then people wonder why the aqueducts don't work anymore. whoop de doo So um, uh, there's a bigger scheme to this. There's a pro program that's been put out by the Rhino Trumpistas, Federalist Society actually, but is there much a difference these days? Um, that is proclaiming their plans for the 2025 agenda. Does, if Donald Trump is their president, fine and dandy, or any Republican is their plan. They, they have a whole slew of things of changing the judiciary and increasing the power of the president to overrule uh, the uh, legislative branches. I mean, there's just dangerously crypto-fascist, anti-American, screaming, don't do this, um, kinds of stuff in that agenda. And the fact that so many of them will be greasing the wheels with such um, the, of a patina of uh, academic credentials, uh, nice, pleasantly dressed people in suits and the like that hold conferences in, in various think tanks and the like, and uh, their interactions then with the subterranean support network of money bags, billionaires, funneling money into groups to get um, astroturf organizations to oppose various things from woke agenda to uh, CRT. Um, yes, as I'm sure it's, yes, there's been quite a few. I haven't seen his particular thing, but that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, there's been postings on it from <coughs> um, various venues uh, that uh, have gone, whoa, Hemet Mehta, I think, is aware of it, uh, that anybody that looks into this thing should just be scared daylights that any of this would actually be implemented. And I have no reason to suspect that um, a lot of it wouldn't be implemented regardless of which Republican gets elected, which means you can't have a Republican as president again, ever.
And in fact, the Republican Party has to die on the vine. Uh, it's going to be around for a while, though. It's not going to die on the vine immediately. There's going to be various demographic sectors where they have enormous powers. Some of the states, Wisconsin and other places, are just deeply divided between people with functioning brain stamps and rhino Trumpistas. And so it's, um, by the way, that this had been fomented by um, conservative news media people who have been dividing people for decades in some cases. So there's just just a lot of, of um, yeah, I saw some clips of Hemet Mehta talking about, it. yeah. Um, the stakes are really, really, really high. And so um, you can anticipate that probably 75 million people are going to vote for Trump or Trump-like characters again in 2024, maybe more than 75. Uh, um, even getting voter turnout doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are going to end up not voting for the crazy people. So uh, it's uncertain what the hell is going to go on. Um, I want a, a world of progress and advancement. Uh, there's so much we need to do in the sciences. There's so much we need to do in retooling our economy to cut down on greenhouse gases so the younger people don't die. Um, the one um, promising note is that there's an enormous upswell among young people who really are getting pissed off at the inaction of people my age or even older when you get into the Mitch McConnell and stuff, you know, these vitrified uh, folks. Um, I may be 71, but I try not to be too petrified, just be continuously active. Um, yeah, the, the gerrymandering, some, the, the one partial kind of happy note is that even the Supreme Court, the Trumpista Supreme Court is not bending over backwards in favor of these gerrymanders, that there are processes in place that are saying, nah, no, you can't go with that. There's a lot of downsides to the, uh, uh, court and but but you, you found the same sort of circumstance with Scalia, who could be he was hyper conservative and did that absolutely preposterous uh, dissent to Edwards v. Aguilar, which of course didn't take effect because it was a dissent. Who knows whether it might get overturned uh, in a future Trump uh, court ruling? But anyway, uh, Scalia was a great defender of free speech so that he would often plop down on the liberal side on these things. And so you may find little elements of not ridiculously bad decisions coming from the Trump court. The problem is there's going to be an awful lot of stupid decisions. And I unfortunately see that given the longevity and the relative youth of a lot of the people in there, that um, we're going to have a mess uh, uh, for quite a few decades at least. Um, maybe I'll live long enough to see the end of the tunnel. We'll find out. I'm not planning on checking out too soon. Uh, yeah, that, that's, and that, that's an important thing that there's, that there's a, an increasing counter network of people who, first of all, we have to get, tell people don't be cynical and recognize that you need to look at what's doable and you need to have to look at what the alternatives are. All of my political life, I've looked at alternatives. And so even though I voted for Republicans and Democrats of various stripes over the years, it always had to do with, here's the situation that we have as a totality, and here are the choices we can take, and which one will uh, get me closer to where we need to go, or not farther away from where we want to go, um, compared to the alternative. And uh, I, I've not had any stupendously depressing moments of where, yikes, I regretted voting for particular. I didn't I certainly didn't vote for Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, the problem with me supporting any Republican over the last 20 years or so has been because the Republican Party has gone increasingly anti-science, pseudoscience. Now, they don't look at it that way. They think they're being as reasonable as all get out. But. Nope, sorry, not working that way. Um, we need to all push the overtone uh, windows left so we can at least see the center again. Yeah, the well, the there has been to some extent a, a, a more uh, an expansion of the Democratic Party back to include more very very left people. Uh, Bernie Sanders um, is much more overtly publicly left, and and Ocasio Cortez and that sort of uh, of ones uh, that would have been 
really woo, uh, in 1995. Now, there would have been elements that would have been perilously close to that viewpoint in 1975 and 65, although they would have tended to keep kind of low key about it. So there's been shifts back and forth. Um, but the Democratic Party has everybody from almost Republican E mansion all the way out to the Bernie Sanders and that on the uh, far left wing and to some maybe even farther uh, left. But overall, it has a broad spectrum of circumstance and overall, other than Robert Kennedy Jr., um, tends to be pro-science and pro-data. And that's what makes somebody like Kennedy a weird outlier in an otherwise not crazy trained Democratic Party. Move over to the Republicans and it has been compressing more and more and more and more and more to the point where there used to be liberals in the Republican Party. There used to be genuine moderates. Now what's called a moderate is just a not as crazy train conservative as the ones that are the crazy train conservatives that are so far to the right that they are off the scope compared to what would have been tolerable back in the way Matt Buckley generation of 30 years ago. Um, they're fitting some important ledge might do the right thing out of the pulling point. Well, um, that's uh, there's another issue about... Um, uh, what it takes to be a political leader. In many respects, Bernie Sanders is not terribly good at building coalitions. He's a truculent person. Uh, um, he, he's he's um, very keen in his convictions and he's for the working man. And there's an awful lot about Bernie's views and the, the things that he does that I can agree with him 100% on. But leadership at the presidential level requires a very precise skill set. And not everybody does it well. Uh, you can be as smart as all get out and not necessarily be a great president. You do have to have decency of character. And Bernie, I'm sure, uh, has no reason to think he doesn't have that. Um, but you also have to have the capacity to be able to persuade the opponent that if you don't necessarily completely agree, you can find a common ground to get something done. For all of his many, many faults, Reagan had that capacity. Franklin Roosevelt had that capacity. Another person with a great deal of faulty, you know, he was having side affairs all over the place. Um, and Lincoln uh, is yet another example of that. Lincoln had a just profound sense about what needed to be done and what you needed to do to get to there and how you couldn't be derailed by stuff. The, the, the film that Sp Steven Spielberg did, Lincoln, is a I think an important primer uh, on this matter about what statecraft means. Lincoln arguably is the most brilliant person ever to be president of the United States. He's so brilliant that people who were brilliant around him didn't quite realize how brilliant he was until quite a long time of knowing him. Seward, his secretary of state, uh, was a brilliant guy and knew how brilliant he was and wanted to be president himself, and he was pissed that he didn't get the nomination and wasn't president in 1860 instead of Lincoln. Uh, and yet Lincoln turns around and makes him Secretary of State. And quite a ways down the road, uh, Seward comes to the conclusion that if he's in a room with Lincoln and a bunch of other people, Seward is not the smartest guy in the room, it's Lincoln. And Lincoln is so smart that he doesn't make you realize that. Some people, um, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wendell Wilkie. Uh, I'll put the uh, little thing in here. Um, I'll think I'll get the spelling right. It, 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 it ran for president a couple times. Uh, oh, no, no, not Will, oh, Wendell Wilkie. Uh, Dewey, Tom Dewey. There we go. Wrong Republican. Although I have my admiration for Wilkie, too. Uh, ran against FDR. But Tom Dewey who ran against uh, uh, FDR in 44 and again uh, in 48 against um, uh, Truman. Uh, he, as uh, Alice Roosevelt Longworth called him, he looks like the, the man on the wedding cake. <laughs> and that's an accurate description. Dewey was a bright guy. He was a fairly progressive governor of New York and a competent one. And he was as smart as all get out. And he let you know it. You, you would never be in a room with Dewey without you realizing that he knows how smart he is. Uh, and that may work fine and even pretty good at the governor level.
But wow, I think that's not necessarily a help if you're at the presidential level. So yes, Dewey, Dewey wins. Yes, Dewey beats Truman, I think the thing was, on the, uh, and Truman holding it up. Now that was a special case in 48 because there were four candidates for president in 1948. There was Truman on the Democratic side. He had become president because FDR dropped dead in, in 45. And so vice president suddenly becomes president. So he runs on his own term in 48. Uh, Dewey is reprising his campaign. So he was the 44 president nominee. Now he's the 48. And um, there were also two other candidates on the field. You had um, a, um, oh gosh, um, agriculture secretary, a uh, very left wing. Oh God, I suddenly forgot his name. Um, progressive party guy. Uh, an awful lot of the Hollywood lo a bunch loved him. Uh, and he had kind of a soft spot for the Soviet Union. I mean, there's a lot of, oh, I'll think of him at some point, probably too late to, for the discussion. Um, and then on the right wing, right wing side, uh, Strom Thurmond, who broke with the conventional Democrats. He was a nice, good old Southern racist. And uh, he formed the Dixiecrat Party. <laughs> Doesn't have any connotations of the Confederacy there, does it? So both of those candidates, God, what the hell was, uh, um, it's a plain basic name. It's like Johnson or something, uh, but I, 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 the name suddenly escapes me of what the damn Democrat was. Uh, anyway, both of them peeled off votes from the left and the right. So very, very conservative people uh, who uh, didn't like civil rights would be voting for uh, Strom Thurmond. And then people who thought we were um, uh, getting into too much trouble with uh, uh, opposing the Soviet Union and we needed to have a wonderful socialist utopia, uh, would be going for the fellow on the progressive ticket whose name I cannot remember. <laughs> and um, uh, that split the things apart. Uh, and so that's part of the reason why Truman ends up winning. So there's an awful lot of sidebars in there. Uh, it was a very contentious period. This was a period, uh, 48 campaign. That's when you, uh, Richard Nixon voted in as one of the uh, uh, people in Congress. You have uh, uh, Joe McCarthy, I think, comes in in the, in the 48 campaign. And so you've got a whole bunch of people that are on a lot of different things going on. Uh, and... Um, uh, it's the Oppenheimer era. Uh, for those of you who have seen the Oppenheimer movie, that straddles that period uh, through the 40s and into the 50s, and that it's, which is pretty good historically. There's a few little minor quibbles uh, with it, as is typically the case, but overall, it gets an awful lot. The, the, it was based on a book uh, and some really wonderful performances where I would be looking at various actors in there and going, holy moly, that's Rob, uh, Robert Downey. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> It took me a bit to realize, my gosh, that, that uh, uh, he looks so unlike what we're typically seeing him in, you know, like the Iron Man movies and that. Um, and uh, then there was uh, the, oh, um, the Numbers series that was on CBS way long time ago. I think it's still shown in reruns on some of the little cable uh, secondary channels. A very nice little detective story about this clever mathematician who would solve things mathematically. Anyway, the main character in there... Um, uh, is in uh, Oppenheimer and I'm looking, my God, woo. And finally is the way he moved his mouth at certain points. I realized, you know, he, I think he had uh, uh, gained a considerable amount of weight for this particular part. And so it was just like, whoa, okay, why do you look vaguely familiar? Anyway, um, which is a roundabout way of saying you should see Oppenheimer. It's, it's, it's a really quite well done movie. Uh, I'm quite impressed with it. Uh, yes, numbers. Yes, I used to watch with the beat. The, the, the one thing is turned around uh, on the beat. Uh, it was a cleverly done. It was one of the few examples of a series where they tried to build off of the implications of higher level science thinking and the mathematical structure of things and the predictive modeling of stuff. It, it was it was a, a smart show. You get elements of that in an awful lot of the forensic programs. Um, that uh, kind of filters into the side on there. But Numbers was very overt about it. Uh, to some extent, that new um, series on NBC from the guy that was on The Flash, he's come over and I don't know how long it'll last, um, has a bit of that too about the psychological structure of things. Uh, the um, mystery series, uh, Professor T, which was as an English version, that's good. 
but not as good as the Belgian original, which was all done with subtitles. Uh, I can highly recommend that as well. Plus, it's one of the most deliciously surreal and fabulous character studies. And that is just, just, just a delicious program to watch. But it involves a lot of the bit about the psychology of people and the complexity of relationships and the whole dynamic structure of what motivates people to do crime. And, and so there's a lot of layers of stuff uh, going on. And it's, it's a fun thing to watch. So there's a bit of a digression <laughs> on the matters of politics and science and philosophy. Uh, but all of this far-reaching stuff that we've just had as this rhapsody here for the last 20 minutes or so, that's much harder to do in a society that, that represses information, that um, represses the access to information. It's no coincidence that nations that want to maintain power by being tyranny have to restrict people's access to the Internet and work but libraries and uh, either co-opt or destroy independent press. We see that in Iran. We see that in Putin's Russia, certainly in all the totalitarian theme parks like uh, North Korea. Um, and uh, they can hold power for a while that way. But so long as there are too many people and too much accessibility to information, because a lot of people find ways to sneak around the corners. Uh, that's the one advantage that you have with some of these very advanced uh, computer systems is they're bloody fast. And you can compress, and if you can conceal information, you can slip it through in a way that is invisible to the authorities. And uh, hopefully uh, that will also be a way for information to penetrate into um, the um, insular bubbles that Putin style minds try to do. Oh yes, well, well, the the it's again part of the obsession about the uh, about educational system and vouchers and all the rest. Part of this um, uh, 2025 agenda is to break up and eliminate that kind of um, uh, educational structure. Uh, the, the the mantra that they use is give power back to the parents. Well, if the parent is like Kent Hovind or Donald Trump. Um, and boy, there was a, a incident um, uh, in the Idaho school board meeting uh, in, um, oh, it was in the height of the pandemic. And the school board was talking about whether or not they wanted to have mass mandates and open up schools or not. And, and, um, and Idaho has had a worse um, infection rate, even though they have substantially fewer people than in Washington state, um, because there's a bunch of right wing nutballs. Uh, there and this literal mob of angry parents storming the poor um, um, uh, city council or, or school board council meeting um, to the point where they couldn't hold the meeting. That's not how you can conduct things, especially when the people that are being the mob are Trumpista, Tortukan, creationist, secondary source addicts, never fact check a damn thing. So that's why all that stuff matters. And um, if we're to have of 21st century and 22nd century and 23rd century that is exploring the universe and making life better for more and more people in more and more delightful ways, we have the technology, we've got the skill set, uh, we've got openings that are so absolutely amazing in terms of how we can do things and how we can build buildings in fresh ways and repurpose things and revise things to where we can make fabulous stuff if we're not spending a colossal amount of money blowing each other up or dampening down imaginations either by totalitarian control of information media the way they do in the PRC or by voluntarily dampening down the imagination by controlling the educational system to get rid of anything that reminds people of things they don't want to pay attention to. Doesn't make the things go away. Doesn't make the problems go away. It makes them fester and boil up and then you have revolutions and people are chopping people's heads off. And the, 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 we've been down that road. So we want to have policies that will not generate uh, depressions, uh, certainly not a global depression. That's what brought on World War II. So we don't want that. So there's a whole bunch of things to be done. And there are matters of what economic policies work and what don't. And do I have the slightest 
feeling that the current Republican Party knows what the hell they're doing on matters of economy. And I say, no, they don't. So because I don't want everything to screw up, that dictates what I have to do in the voting bar. Uh, Kevin with the can, don't show the, oh, 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 you mean this? Well, ha, ha, ha. Next week, maybe I'll drink a Coca-Cola. So there. <laughs> uh, since I'm not monetized, uh, uh, I don't think I have to worry too much about that. Anyway, we're past an hour. Uh, thanks for um, uh, the show there. Uh, let me put up the adverts for uh, our little book. Let me get my little doodads out here. There we go. Put that over there and then do that over there. Get my little window up. Get my little media on there. Get that shared up there. Do, 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 do. And the rocks are there. You can see right there. Available from Amazon. Uh, it would be wonderful if it were there. Well, you could probably order it through local bookstores because I know people have bought the books uh, from Eddie's and others, so it can be done. And um, the science books, I'm very proud of them. And the fiction, the paralogs of fog. I'm busy working on book three. There's going to be 12 altogether if I manage to live long enough. Which, not wood, I shall be. Uh, but it's, as an air quotes retired person, um, I'm more busy now than I really was when I was working in service of the man in times past. So I'm having a field day, and I want to continue to have a field day. Thanks to all the patrons, and thanks to the wonderful, wonderful world of information that is available freebies. Um, and that's another point that everyone should uh, call attention to people. We live in an absolute utopia of information accessibility. So anybody who believes stupid things because they have been too lazy to find the correct information, well, it's on them. It's not because they can't find the information. It's not because it's not out there. It's because they're too lazy to look or too inept to fact check it. So anyway, keep on the lookout for wooden penguins. That's important. And be safe and worry about if you're being flooded or hit with heat waves or if terrible people are bombing you. There's places where that's happening or starvation. I mean, there's a bunch of problems that are going on. We need to resolve all of these things. Um, oh, good. So, so, well, yeah, I was just blathering, uh, um, saying that um, uh, I'm proud of the works and uh, will continue to do them. Uh, to the time when I'm stopping, I will keel over on my keyboard, hopefully. Uh, that will be the end of that. Uh, and um, uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, kids, uh, see you next week. And um, uh, don't accept any wooden penguins.